Hello, welcome to everyone uh, who is joining us on this broadcast. My name is Alex Maws. I'm the head of educational grants and projects at the Association of Jewish Refugees. We're really pleased to be able to spend the next 30 minutes or so telling you a little bit about our work and uh, how it relates to Yom HaShoah and to the liberation of Belson and some other things that you might be interested in. We're really proud to be a supporter of Yom HaShoah, the UK national event. We do this through our educational grants funding program. We were, so I wanted to just start by introducing you a little bit to the broader work of the Association of Jewish Refugees. And to do that, I wanted to ask our chief executive, Michael Newman, to tell us a little bit about the AJR. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so the AJR is primarily a social welfare organization attending to the social welfare uh, care needs of our members, which are predominantly refugees who came to Britain in the late 30s from Central Europe. But we also have some survivors who joined as well, including some of those who were liberated from Belston uh, that we're commemorating, who we're commemorating this week. And so the organization was founded in 1941 by the refugees to help themselves integrate into life in Britain and to be a support network for each other. And the, the, the basic nature of the work of the organization hasn't changed in all those years. We've always had a social services department. We've always had volunteers. We've also always had a regional presence. So we haven't always been a Northwest London community organization. And you mentioned earlier about the current coronavirus uh, emergency, the current situation. So in the current climate, we're trying to be in touch with as many of our members as possible through a phone around and through virtual meetings, just to check in on them to make sure that they have the, you know, food, medicine, that they have some opportunities for stimulation to help break uh, isolation which we know can be as have a detrimental effect on people's lives, particularly overlaid with the trauma that they may have experienced in the past. So all our efforts are now vested in trying to be in contact with and support our members as much as we can virtually, uh, as opposed to being able to see them uh, physically. It's a bit of a challenge, fortunately, we are a national organization, so we have colleagues all around the country, social workers, uh, members of our volunteer department staff, as well as uh, in excess of 300 volunteers who are supplementing that work, who are able to be in touch with our members on a very regular basis uh, and to make sure that we are addressing needs and concerns that they might have as much as possible. So I want to also take the opportunity to thank everybody for what they're doing. Uh, and it's also uh, a chance to say that if throughout the community there are survivors and refugees that people may, who may know of that might need some assistance, uh, particularly at this critical time, then please do let us know. That's brilliant. It's worth saying that next year, the AJR will be celebrating our 80th anniversary. Our work has been going on for a long time prior to coronavirus, and we expect very much that it will continue uh, as it always does after this crisis is over. This might be a good time actually for us to uh, cut away to show a, a short three minute video that we made uh, just a couple of years ago that showcases our work in, uh, in normal times, we would say. So let's have a look at that. visiting Judy for about eight years now. I think of my daughter at 17 and then Judy at 17 when she bought herself a nurse's uniform, dressed up and got on the train and cared for the little ones so the Nazis when they boarded the train ignored her. Judy puts life back into perspective. I arrived with the last kinder transport 1939 and I was 17 years old. Max 
vaccines come here to advise me, to make me feel better, sort out things that I was confused with. <laughs> She's a lovely person. My family are very grateful to AJR that I can stay here on my own and be comfortable. I don't want to go into a home. I don't want to go anywhere else. I couldn't, I couldn't be here without AJR. It works. I think it's really important. I think it's an absolute honour, if anything, to hear the story. And I'll, I'll carry on visiting Eva if she lets me. It's important to see what has happened and maybe derive some good out of it. Although in the early days I never needed anything or wanted anything, AGI helps me tremendously today and they're absolutely amazing. you all enjoyed that uh, that brief video about the work of the AJR and as Michael said a moment ago please do get in touch with us if there's any way that um, that we could be of, of service either to you or a relative of yours I wanted to um, pivot a little bit to this is a, a nice transition from our, our work with our members to look after their social welfare and uh, and our commemorative work as well and Deborah you uh, oversee. I want to introduce my colleague Deborah Barnes, who oversees the My Story Project, and this is a nice combination of both of those functions of the AJR. I was hoping you could tell our viewers a little bit about the work that you do there. Hi, everybody. I um, work on the My Story Project. So this is a um, volunteer-led testimony project which AJR have been running for over three years now, and we work with. Um, volunteers um, who we match up with one of our members who want to tell their life story and it's like a befriending process so they go and visit them normally they go and visit them in their own homes and record their life story over several visits um, these days we're doing it over the telephone so we're very lucky that we're able to continue work on this wonderful project and um, the result is a professionally um, designed and printed um, book. Here's the one I've got at home, the only one I've got at home at the moment, uh, which we present, we gift copies to our members. Um, and I have to say that the feedback that we get from our volunteers and our members and their families is always extremely positive. It's a very positive, uplifting experience for everybody. So one of the books that we've uh, produced is uh, The Life Story of Eva Bihal, who was born in Romania in 1925. Eva was in Auschwitz and in Bergen-Belsen um, at the time of liberation. And her, one of her grandchildren, her grandson, Paul, uh, has very kindly recorded himself reading some extracts from Eva's book, which we're going to um, see now. Liberation. I was reasonably better whatever that means, but barely able to stand on my feet. Food was non-existent and we were scrummaging all over the place trying to find something to eat, but there was nothing. Days went on and then the people said that British forces were coming and that the war was nearly finished, but nobody believed it. I remember someone helping me up, propping me up against the wooden wall of the barrack. I watched Grace and Krama in a British vehicle, a jeep, saying, your day has come, you are liberated, and you are free people. Both Kramer and Grace were hung on the 13th of December, 1945. We were liberated on the 15th of April, 1945. 
I was half dead, half alive, and I stood there, but I couldn't take it in. Somebody asked me if I felt joy, but I didn't feel anything. I was incapable of feeling any emotion or joy or sadness or anything at all. The British made the Germans dig graves, which still exist in Belsen today. I've seen them on my return. Huge graves of 10,000 people, 3,000 people, 5,000 people, heaps of skeletons, skin on bone, no flesh on any of the dead. There was no flesh on any of us. The British did not know what to do. Look after the dead, look after the half dead, or look after the living. We were taken to a barrack that was made into a type of medical unit where I was disinfected and washed with hoses and given clean clothes. I cannot tell you how wonderful the British were, but I can tell you that the love and warmth I had for them has never been forgotten in the 75 years I've been in this country. Unfortunately, the British soldiers who liberated us did not realize what they were confronted with. They left a food warehouse open and those poor people who were on their feet were able to go there and eat whatever they could find. Many of them died. They stuffed themselves with food and their stomachs couldn't take it. And we lost a lot of people. They were liberated and then they were gone. I was too ill still, so I was taken to this hospital, deloused, and gradually I started to eat. I can't tell you anymore. I was just too ill, and I don't remember if anyone from my bunk survived. The British had learned their lesson with the warehouse, and we were fed very gently. I was getting on my feet and getting better. We were getting parcels from the Jewish Relief Unit, and all sorts of little bits of niceness. Excellent. Well, thank you, Deborah, for uh, for producing that video clip there. What an appropriate time to have uh, a grandson reading his grandmother's My Storybook for the first time here on Yom HaShoah. It seems only too fitting. Um, and speaking of stories, personal stories are very much at the heart of another one of our projects that we wanted to highlight today, which is the Refugee Voices Project. And I've invited my colleague, Dr. Bea Lefkowitz, who is the Director of Refugee Voices, to tell us a little bit about that. Bea, tell us, what is Refugee Voices? Thank you, Alex. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a privilege to be here today to talk to you. So, Refugee Voices, we started uh, the AGR Refugee Voices project in 2003. Um, and I'm very, very happy to say that uh, we have now captured 251 interviews. Um, and we have, uh, we launched uh, last November, we launched our website. So you will be able to see those interviews. You can't listen to the testimony, but you go to, you can go to the different institutions who have got it. One of them is the Wiener Holocaust uh, Library. But the most amazing thing is that our oldest interviewee, for example, was born in 1906. So we are very privileged that we started interviewing in 2003 and that we have captured some of the, the older members of the community. And I'm, think, I'm just to say, I'm, on this Yom HaShoah, I'm thinking of all the, all the people we've interviewed, they're safe. Uh, and I'm also thinking of the second generations who sometimes cannot be with their parents, uh, or third generation who can't be with their grandparents. And so I think this will be um, a very poignant Yom HaShoah for many people. Thank you. And you, um, you cut together a video for this occasion as well, didn't you? Yes. So if you go to our website and you go to the concentration camp website and you, each camp has a, its own listing. So if you press on Bergen-Belsen, we have uh, four survivors who were in Bergen-Belsen, but we have also uh, the testimony of Helen Bamber, who worked for the Jewish Relief Unit and came to Belsen a few months after liberation. And, uh, and so we've cut uh, something together uh, with their testimonies. And just to talk a little bit about Helen Bamber, because it's a very uh, moving and special testimony. She was born in 1925. She joined the Jewish uh, the Relief Unit in 44, came to Germany in 1945. And she talks very, very movingly about going into the camp and listening to the survivors and really listening. And she describes it in a very strong language. She said she understood she had to sit down with the survivors and they put their, their fingers into her arms and they needed to tell the story. 
And even if not everyone survived, she felt it was really important to listen to the story and to become a witness. Fantastic. Let's have a look at that video now. thing I remembered most when I first looked at Camp One was the smell and it was the smell and I've never forgotten it it was the smell of um, geraniums like s that sweet dank smell of geraniums and the mounds of the the, gra the mass graves the burials and the fact that people were then incarcerated in the former SS barracks and I spent time talking to people, the survivors, in those dark, cold, you know, barracks. You know, when you first listen to the stories that survivors tell you, uh, you are... You, you feel overwhelmed with the enormity of what they're telling you. Mainly the losses, the losses of so many people. If my husband had done that and if he had only listened to me, he wouldn't have been killed. The kind of if quality. You know, that most of the stories were around the if. If only I'd, you know, when nothing could have saved them, but nothing could have saved them. And you listen to this knowing it. And you felt so helpless. And then I began to feel um, that I had to make closer contact with them. And I sometimes would hold on to people. would sit on the floor, and people would hold on to you. And they, could, they, they, they dug their fingers into your arms. And, they, and I found that rocking, as children who are very deprived and unhappy rock, rocking became a kind of mode that we adopted and we would rock and they would tell their stories and I say that it was like a kind of vomit they would would come out like a vomit you know this the stories and some were terrible I felt that okay I am listening to this and they are wanting me to listen so perhaps my role is to be their witness and to say to them that that's my role. To say to them the truth, I can't bring those people back. But I can listen and I can be your witness and I will be your witness. And I think to those people who were going to die, and there were people who were going to die, and I knew that, I think it was incredibly important and I've never, you know, people say to me, why is it so important that, that people's story must be told? But it is, it's absolutely vital that their story is told and that they know that their story is going to be told. I do remember the transport to Belson, which was not one of those cattle trucks as one sees, because all um, trains were were co-opted for use for these transports which were being done by the tens of thousands and in fact I apparently travelled on a, a normal train and we went into Belson and um, my father was separated from us and I was with my mother. Uh, having suffered from uh, asthma a bit and the sheer thought of having somebody so close to me uh, on the middle bunk or bottom bunk, I just couldn't face it. So my mother made every effort that we would get. Not that it made much difference because the roof of the barrack was so close on top of us, but for me, not having a person above us made me feel that it was safer. It was very cold. It was very uncomfortable and bleak. The food was uh, transpired then was very poor and everything was, seemed to be made of turnips. There was turnip soup, and there was turnip jam, and there was turnip coffee, and, um, and, and very little of it. And bread, no doubt, also had turnips in it. We had a ration every day, 
um, and there were sort of churns which came with some sort of soup which had practically nothing in it um, uh, of, of any uh, food value um, and, uh, and, and was very little of it. I mean, that, that is when we started to experience hunger and cold. I certainly remember the food, uh, what there was of it. It was dreadful. Um, there was water, a turnip boiled in water, and that was known as a soup, and this one piece of turnip, and a piece of black bread, very hard. And uh, that was the day's ration. My parents gave me theirs. Uh, it wasn't enough to keep body and soul together, but I took theirs because I was hungry and I didn't know any different. And they starved to death. Um, my mother in December, no, sorry, my father in December, 44, and my mother in January, 45. I used to faint every day from hunger. I was a child growing up and her parents couldn't think about it. The soup was brought in in such churns like they bring milk today. So the men had took turns to go to the kitchen to fetch those big churns. And then one opportunity was when you went to the kitchen that you could steal something. My father's turn came as well, he went. And my father brought back an onion. Now, uh, we peeled that onion and we sat down to eat it. We felt that onion in every part of our body. The onion is such a strong, healthy food that our fingertips began tingling. So since then, for me, an onion is a very important food. Um, and Eva, who always loved drawing and eventually became an artist and an art teacher, um, uh, had taken with her a little sketchbook and one of these tiny paint boxes. And she must have had some color pencils. This was gold dust. To have a pencil at all was absolute gold dust. You know, children nowadays, they chuck about their biros. Thank goodness, that's lovely. They're cheap and plentiful. But to have a pencil and a piece of paper was, was really something. And she drew pictures. Um, I wish I had it here to show you. Um, a main, occasionally camp scenes, barracks with bunk beds and so on. But mainly um, very, very colorful fairy stories. You know, Snow White and the dwarfs and, 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 and Red Riding Hood and so on. Very brightly colored, which of course took her away from where she was. I remember being told by Mrs. Bilnbaum that my mother had died. It was a common occurrence in the camp. And um, she said, Jetzt musste sehr stark sein, gutes Kind. You have to be very strong and brave. And um, so I took that to heart. But I don't think I understood what she what she said to me because I went back to look in the window to see where she was. I do remember that. Perhaps again, my mother must have tried and sent more and more. You know, tomorrow will be better or whatever, just to try and make me worry less. Or she had would give me her crust of bread. Or it's. It, you know, I find it even difficult now to think how people, how parents managed, yeah. what they did, how they spoke to their children. I, mean, I think as a child I very much took each day as it came. And we, I certainly had no idea, you know, one, one didn't as a child really think of how this might end. I think our most, most of my sort of concentration was focused on hunger and cold and fear, I suppose, those three things. And, um, and you concentrated on those things rather on th what might happen tomorrow. Um, I can't remember thinking how will this end or what will we do. I didn't think ahead, which perhaps is as well.
Uh, thank you very much, Bea, for putting together that video. That's another sort of Yom HaShoah exclusive uh, that, that we have, uh, that we produced just for today. Now, I wanted to ask both Deborah about uh, my story and Bea about Refugee Voices. If there are people who have a story that they might want to tell in either one of these formats, is there a way for them to get in touch with you, Deborah? Yes, absolutely. So anybody who's interested in volunteering on this project can um, get more information from the AJR website. Um, you would need to um, apply to be a volunteer and, uh, and, and that'll be great. Great. Thank you. And Bea, how about for Refugee Voices? Uh, yes, so we have adapted ourselves to the situation and we are pioneering now remote oral history interviews which will involve either um, if people have the capacity, a Zoom recording, um, or we can do a telephone recording. So if anyone is interested, please get in touch and we can set up an interview. Um, mm -hmm. And it's going to be different from the original interview, but uh, we will do our best and it will be part of, of our collection. So please get Thank in touch. You. That's great. Michael, I wanted to ask you, how do you see this element of the AJR's work? How does it fit alongside or how does it fit within the AJR's wider, wider mission? Well, it's very important to keep in mind that both the My Story and the Refugee Voices projects are also capturing uh, the unique heritage, culture and history uh, and the traditions of the refugees and survivors because the collections uh, start by talking about the life of the interviewee before the war and that's something which very much reflects the origins of the organization which was an organization that brought that uh, represented and brought the um, traditions and heritage of the refugees from central europe to britain and how that has been preserved and how those refugees and survivors adapted to life in britain so uh, it this is very much a reflection of the whole uh, history, the whole span of the organization's history since its founding in 1941. Excellent. And I'll just put in a, a brief plug as we, as we finish up here to say that, you know, I know, Bea, you and I have spoken quite a bit over the years about how important it is for people to make use of these testimonies. It's yeah. not, we don't just want them to sit uh, on a hard drive somewhere. One of the projects that you and I work on together is our uh, Kinder Transport Remembering and Rethinking podcast, which uses some of the extracts uh, from the Refugee Voices Archive, the ones that are specific to people who came to Britain on the Kinder Transport, and it tries to tell the story of the Kinder Transport using the voices of, of those people who experienced it firsthand. And I think that uh, as we finish up this uh, AJR segment of the Yom HaShoah broadcast, that's, that's a fitting way to finish, which is remembering that so much of what we're here to do today is to pay tribute to the voices of those uh, who suffered under Nazism, refugees and survivors, and on behalf of all of us at the AJR, we want to thank those of you who are spending part of your day today um, just uh, taking a moment out to commemorate this history, uh, Yom HaShoah is such an important event for the Jewish community. And as I said in the introduction, we're, we're very proud to, to be a sponsor of it. So on behalf of all of us, uh, my colleagues at the AJR, Michael, Bea, and Deborah, who are here today, and, and all of us who aren't on this broadcast, we wanted to, to thank you for tuning in. And we hope we'll have a chance to see you all again in person, ideally, uh, in the not too distant future. Thanks very much. <laughs>